I'm Scott Weatherly. Welcome to 20th Century Geek. For centuries, children had enjoyed a childhood and grown up when reaching a much earlier age than would be considered reasonable today. The world was such that as soon as you were able, you had to join the workforce, contributing to the family's earnings. The result was, for the majority of people, a life broken into a relatively short childhood and a work-focused adulthood. This began to change with the Industrial Revolution and the increased focus on education in the 19th century. The change became more pronounced following the First World War. The length of time spent in education increased, and for the first time youths were sharing long periods of time with others their own age, with a reduced influence from older adults. Also, being in school alleviated the pressure of responsibility. This created a new social and developmental structure. No longer children, and no longer yet old enough to be adults. They were literally in between the accepted periods of development. The use of this social structure started to establish their own rules and idiosyncrasies. By the 1930s, they could be identified by fashion and the use of slang. Also, more increasingly, they were demonstrating a desire to be perceived differently from their parents. The rumbling of a need to find something to rebel against. This was made easier for them with the wider availability of cars in the late 1930s and 40s. The new social structure for adolescents had formed in the first part of the 20th century, and now they had the freedom of the open road. It was in 1941 that the term teenager was first used to describe this period of development in Popular Science Monthly. The teenager was born, and would start having an impact on the direction of pop and counterculture almost immediately. As the 1950s got underway, the newly established teenagers were searching for a voice, a figurehead, to identify with and represent them. A number of candidates stood out at the time and defined different aspects of teenage culture. James Dean and Chuck Berry each had a huge impact, but in 1956 a figure came forward with a debut album that encapsulated everything they had wanted in a figurehead. Long live the king, Elvis Presley. Elvis was born on January 8th, 1935, the survivor of a pair of twins. As a boy, Elvis was academically average, but showed an ear and a talent for music, despite being considered shy. Noting this, he was given a guitar for his birthday, and quickly learned how to play. When he was 13, he and his parents moved to Memphis, Tennessee. It was here that he met several mentors who taught him more about playing the guitar. Also, during his teenage years, he spent a lot of time listening to songs on jukeboxes and in listening booths, learning to learn songs by ear rather than learning to read music. He favoured country music performers such as Roy Acuff, Jimmy Rogers and Bob Willis. He also frequented live performances of gospel music and blues musicians, including B.B. King. By the time he was due to graduate, Elvis knew that music was his future. To cover the whole of Elvis's life from this point to his death in 1977 would take more time than I have in this podcast. So to provide a context to his life and career, I have chosen to focus on five key events that shaped Elvis into the legend that we know today. I know this doesn't provide an in-depth look at the life of Elvis, but my hope is that by highlighting these events, I am able to provide enough insight for you to understand how and why he is so iconic. Also, establish some milestones in his life so that if you wanted to find out more, you have an idea where to start. I have read a number of articles and blogs about Elvis's life, and following his childhood, the first major milestone in becoming the king was meeting and being signed by Colonel Tom Parker. Parker had been a part of the music industry for almost a decade as a promoter for several artists such as Minnie Pearl and Hank Snow, by the time he came across a young Elvis Presley. He booked him for a gig as an opening act in August 1955. He had seen him previously and he had been impressed by what the young musician could do on stage, as well as his singing style. He knew there was potential for him to make it big. At the time, Elvis had a contract with a local radio host, Bob Neal, 
The intention was to protect Elvis from dodgy promoters that would take advantage of the young musician's naivete. Unfortunately, Neil was not prepared for the attention Elvis would start to receive. After the first meeting with Parker and several discussions, Elvis and Neil agreed to give Parker some control and influence. Initially, they worked closely to promote Elvis, booking him as a support act on touring shows. However, Parker's level of control quickly started to increase. One of the key factors that helped keep Parker's influence in check was that Elvis was still a minor, and so all contracts and decisions had to be agreed by his parents. Another was the label Elvis was contracted with at the time. He had been with Sun Records since the beginning, and its owner, Sam Phillips, was not going to let him leave any time soon. Parker had started negotiations, but Phillips had made it clear it would take $40,000 to buy Elvis out of his existing contract. That's the equivalent of $350,000 today. Parker was courting a number of possible labels, but none were offering the $40,000 amount that was needed. The only one that considered that Elvis's potential could possibly mean they would get the money back was RCA Victor. However, even they started with an offer limited to $25,000. Parker continued the hard sell, working to convince them that Elvis was going to be the next big thing. He was eventually successful, and RCA stumped up the $40,000. And on the 21st of November, 1955, Elvis's label contract was transferred from Sun to RCA. As well as being represented by Parker, Musician Hank Snow was co-owner of Jamboree Attractions with Parker. Snow attended the Elvis contract signing, believing that as co-owner, he was part of the management team. This was not entirely true, as Elvis was actually still being managed by Bob Neal. Without Snow knowing, Parker had agreed that for a financial settlement, Bob Neal would not renew his management contract when it expired, meaning that Parker could take the job for himself. So when Neil's contract expired, as agreed, Elvis signed an exclusive contract with Tom Parker. Following the signing, Snow asked Parker about the content of the contract they had now. Parker replied, You don't have any contract with Elvis Presley. Elvis is signed exclusive to the Colonel. The signing of that contract solidified a partnership that would define the progression of music for the next 20 years. A good portion of that was about the music. But just as important was the look and style. Parker knew more people needed to see Elvis perform. The second milestone I've decided to highlight is his first appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1956. Ed Sullivan had made it pretty clear over time that he was not a fan of the new rock and roll artists that were appearing. He had even mentioned explicitly that Elvis was not his cup of tea. He had also barked at the appearance fee of $5,000. However, Elvis had made an appearance on a competing show earlier and the ratings had trounced Sullivan. Not wanting to lose out again, Sullivan had his team approach Parker. This time the appearance fee was $50,000. An unprecedented sum at the time. On September 9th, 1956, Elvis appeared on the season opener. Sullivan was not on the show. He was in hospital after a car accident at the time. Elvis appeared from a studio in Hollywood and dressed to impress and started saying that being on this show was probably the greatest honour I have ever had in my life. Following this, he started to perform and two very important things happened. The first was announcing and introducing Love Me Tender as something completely different from anything that had been done before. Based on this, disc jockeys across the country recorded the performance in order to play it on their shows before it was released for sale. It's estimated that this pre-sale broadcasting of the song pushed the pre-orders to almost over a million. The second was the performance itself. For the first couple of songs, Elvis was filmed from, what, from the waist up. However, for his final two songs, he was filmed in full and the home audience got to understand why the live studio audience was so excited. Elvis's hip swivels and gyrations got everyone's attention 
and gained an 82.6% of the evening's TV watching audience. This performance established Elvis as a rock and roll star for a generation and can be credited with the success of Love Me Tender, but Elvis's star was still climbing. Elvis had become a rock and roll sensation with his appearance on television, but he did not want to stop there. He wanted to become a movie star. Elvis had always had an interest in acting, and more than that, wanted to ensure that he could separate his music from his acting. He was happy to use his position to get his foot in the door, but wanted to be taken seriously once he had made it. Parker, on the other hand, had a different plan. While he agreed with the idea of Elvis appearing in movies, he saw this as an opportunity to cross-promote Elvis and the soundtracks on which Elvis would sing. In March 1956, Elvis completed a screen test for Hal Wallace, in which he impressed all involved. It was clear that he had the charisma and the talent to be a good actor. The success of this screen test resulted in Elvis being offered a contract for one film, with the option for six more, also providing him the opportunity to appear in one other film for another studio a year. Despite attempts by all parties, it was not possible to find a role for Elvis within the studios. Eventually, he was loaned out to 20th Century Fox for them to make Love Me Tender. He began filming on August 22nd, 1956. Despite originally having trepidation about the role because, spoilers, his character died at the end, he arrived on set not only having learned his lines, but all the lines. He took on the task of filming seriously, despite finding the process difficult. However, within a month, he had completed all his scenes and recorded all the songs for the film. Before it was released, Elvis and his mother were given a private screening. When his character died at the end, his mother was driven to tears. Elvis promised that from that point on, he would not die on screen again. The film was released nationwide on November the 21st, 1956, to a record-breaking 575 screens. The film opened at number two on its first weekend with $540,000 and went on to become a financial success. The film only received mildly positive reviews from critics. Elvis received very positive reviews. It was acknowledged that he could act as well as sing. He was an all-round star. But Elvis himself later admitted that he regretted compromising and adding in the songs, as it set a precedent for the rest of his movie career. At this point, Elvis and Colonel Parker were quickly climbing the ladder of success and fame. Elvis was a sensation and continued to define a generation of rock and roll. This was broken up by a stint in the army, after which he achieved his first US number one single and spent the next seven years touring. As the 60s moved on, Elvis began to fear that he was becoming uncool during the swinging 60s. New bands such as the Beatles and the Stones were introducing innovative and creative music. Moreover, his films were starting to make less and less money. It felt as if his star was falling. Parker was struggling to get the minimum $1 million fee for each movie. So he decided to try something different. He arranged for a TV special that was to be broadcast during the Christmas season as a Christmas Carol special. However, the chosen director, Steve Binder, made a suggestion that would change the direction of the show and Elvis's career. Use the show as a chance to revamp Elvis, to be more in line with the times. In order to do this, a flexible approach to setting up the show was taken. They had an objective to use large set pieces to showcase Elvis's talents, but they were willing to listen to any suggestion of how this could look or be done. The final show included gospel singing, short movie sequences and live performances with fantastic stage designs. A further segment set in a bordello was passed by the censors but was removed before being broadcast on December 3rd 1968 after the primary sponsor considered it too risque. The broadcast was a great success and was the highest rated TV special for the year and is considered the first one-man TV special to be broadcast on commercial TV. 
The objective of the show was to revitalise Elvis's career, making him relevant again. In that objective, it was a success. By 1968, Elvis's music sales had reached a low point, which, in addition to the waning success of his films, led to some to consider his career at an end. In 1969, however, he started touring again, including a period in Vegas, performing in front of sell-out crowds. He also scored another US number one with Suspicious Minds. Elvis had struggled through a low point in his career and taking a chance on the TV special was able to enjoy more years of success. Despite this new period of success, Elvis's age and lifestyle was going to catch up with him. Between his comeback special and early 1977, Elvis's lifestyle had become a spiral of self-destructive behaviour. The sharp, energetic young man that had inspired a generation had become a bloated joke, fuelled by a daily dose of drugs. By this time, his concerts had to be shortened so he could get through them. That was, if he turned up at all. As his performances continued to slide, his fans started to become more vocal, as did the press. The only person who didn't seem to acknowledge the slide was Elvis himself. His final live concert was held on June 26, 1977. Reports of the evening stated that while he looked healthier than he had for some time, he was still a shadow of the performer he had been. He struggled through the performance and looked exhausted and pasty by the end. By July, it was understood that Elvis was suffering from a series of ailments such as glaucoma, high blood pressure, liver damage and an enlarged colon, each exacerbated by his continued drug abuse. This made day-to-day -day life more difficult, but it did not stop the King from wanting to go on tour again. He was due to leave for his next tour on August 16th, 1977. Unfortunately, he was discovered, unresponsive, lying on his bathroom floor. Several attempts were made to revive him, but all were unsuccessful. He was pronounced dead at 3.30pm on the 16th of August, 1977. At Elvis's funeral two days later, the streets of Graceland were lined with over 80,000 people. As a side note, several days later, an unsuccessful attempt was made to steal Elvis's remains. Finally, he was buried next to his mother. The king was at peace, and the world mourned him. From the moment his death was made public, there has been controversy about the, what caused it, and even if he is dead at all. Over the years, there have been several very public investigations, reopening the autopsy and cause of death. At the moment, it is considered that his death was caused by a mixture of the heavy quantity of different drugs in his system, several genetic defects, and a low level of general health. In 1977, it was not a matter of if, but when Elvis would die. The career and death of Elvis Presley created a legend that has become more and more mythic over the time. From my research, looking beyond the legend at the reality and the history, I found a man who loved performing, but who was overtaken by a bubble of celebrity. I wanted to get a better understanding from a fan's perspective, and so contacted Todd Slaughter from the British Elvis fan club. He had some interesting things to say about the King and how fans have accessed him over the years. So, uh, I've done some research on that. Uh, the fan club started in 1957, so like really getting in on the ground floor. Um, yeah. So, but what was your first exposure to Elvis, and sort of how did that affect you? Uh, you have to go back a long time for that because I am 21 <laughs> this week, and oh, as well. a consequence, I was involved uh, really as a kid, um, like most people were. During the 50s, mm -hmm. there was very little telly and um, very little music radio on the BBC apart from Housewife Choice and Two-Way Family Favourites. So the exposure of American rock music really was the diet of what would be Radio Luxembourg in the evening and of course American Forces Network. Um, so when I was 11, when Elvis Presley first started uh, 
as an international act, yeah. I would be uh, twiddling the knobs on the radio, tuning in, because that was quite a fascination to do that, finding stations, English language stations on oh, okay. short wave, long wave, and yeah. medium wave, whatever you could find. And that was my introduction. And I would think most people's introduction who were actively interested in music at that time. And it was without doubt um, Radio Luxembourg that, that did it first. What you also have to remember is there was very little of anything Elvis in, in the press because he was a, a recording artist. Uh, it wasn't until the movies came out that people could actually see him. Oh, okay. And of course, the, controver the controversial stuff, rather like Ed Sullivan. Yes, I mean... I, I, never, I, I, that was never seen over over here because the, the, the BBC, which was the only broadcaster at the time, wouldn't have bought a sponsored programme anyway. Oh, uh, okay. It. I, I was so, uh, I was curious about that because he was you know from the from the get go, you know coming out of Memphis and stuff he's, he's quite quite big in the states. But I was wondering like so, you heard his voice and stuff over here, and, it, and that must have set off, you know, uh, hearts of flutter and all that kind of thing. But so you didn't actually see him until very little imagery. The odd, I think there was the odd feature in the Daily Mirror and probably Re Re Revali, and, and that was really about it. Until the first movie came out, which mm. was Love Me Tender, which really was only four songs and a, a, and a western. It wasn't until the second film, um, the following year, um, Loving You came out, that you saw Elvis in colour. Um, and on um, yeah, and performing a dozen songs. So that was the big difference, I think. You know, when we ever had um, any kind of singing entertainer, you would probably only get them on the telly once in a blue moon, and then that would be in uh, in, in the mid fifties. Very yeah. infrequent. Because, like you say, I suppose it's it's uh, yeah, lim limited channels, limited, limited, limited uh, opportunities for. Yeah, TV, ITV I started, I think, in nineteen fifty-five, but only in London. Oh wow! Oh, oh wow! Well, and then it sort of washed up to the Midlands and the North in 56. Okay. And then at that time it was when variety programmes like Sunday Night at the London Palladium started. Mm -hmm. And it was on those programmes that they used to bring up American guests. And those guests could be either actors in westerns who would warble a song or, or, or you know, people like Johnny Ray and, yeah. and, and acts like that that would come over and perform just really to launch their, their latest singles and that's that's an interesting point you say about because one of the things I was trying to find sort of contemporaries for Elvis around this period um, and it, it kept coming back to I kept finding articles around like, almost like the creation of the teenager in the 40s and early 50s and it sort of suggested that Elvis was almost like the first thing to encapsulate everything for teenagers <coughs> before this that before him there hadn't really been any performers you know that, no, what you've got to remember is that the, the, the economy was totally different in the States to what it was over here. Yeah. Uh, you, you were lucky if, in 1956 if you got a bike to take you to school <laughs> yeah. to cycle on. Uh, but in the States in 1956, they were building car parks on schools. So the, the, the economic difference between the two sides of the pond was, was quite remarkable. Literally and a world such, away. Then you, you would have a situation where touring shows by all kinds of artists but predominantly in the 50s probably country and western those kind of shows in the states packed out major audiences there were very few touring shows around our theaters in the in the mm. early 50s unless there were comedians people like arthur Askey and the like and and the odd singer but yeah. on the whole it was it was um it was a diet of, I suppose, for us, working men's clubs and end of the pier shows. Oh, okay. So it's much small, sort of like smaller community entertainers and um, old school, sort of like your parents kind of uh, singers and entertainers, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, the, the, the Frankie Fawns and, and, and that kind of singer. And of course, on the stage, people like Sinatra and all the, the Rat Pack clan. Mm. That was really a, a, as, as good as it got. And then, of course, she had bursts of people like Petula Clark coming out when she was a kid and, and, and then graduating into to a, a female singing star. Yeah. And Shirley Bassey and all these sorts of acts. Mm. And, of course, in the middle of all of this, but on top of the pile was Elvis. But, of course, we never saw him. We didn't see him live. It, yeah. wasn't, it wasn't something... It was something that was always expected that never really happened. 
Okay, so okay, so that's sort of one of the influences. One of the things I was finding interesting. If you if you if you weren't able to 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 see him so much, it was his sound, um, and really, I suppose that like his where he was brought up. I mean, it was all an influence of like the country, the R and B, and jazz music. So it was a a controversial sound really for that period. Yeah, and that kind of music, to be to be fair, didn't really wash over into the United Kingdom apart from jazz, mm. which was if you uh, which jazz and swing, which was was left over from what was the Second World War and, and the American Forces bases and that kind of entertainment that that, that dragged around that. But of course, it's, it was. I think you had to be around to see just how basic our lifestyle was in, in, in the fifties. I mean, it was not like it is any any at all like today. No, and you wouldn't expect it to be either. So in the in the mid fifties, and you were swept up in uh, in you know Elvis, and ten years later, you purchased uh, the fan club. Um, how, oh, yeah. how, how did that come about? Uh, well, I. I uh, was, I suppose, a frustrated journalist. I, there was a guy called Albert Hunt that did a magazine called Elvis Monthly. He also did a magazine called um, Pop Weekly, and I wrote the occasional feature for Pop Weekly, uh, and was always interested in, in Elvis. But it, um, I wasn't, if you like, active in the Elvis world until I would say about 1962. Prior to that, and then at 1962, I would have been of an age where I just really gone to work, 16, 17 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, like most people, buy the disc, uh, New Musical Express, Record Mirror, and Melody Maker every week just to look at what was going on in the charts. And of course, it was dominated by Elvis and, and, and the British stars like to Richard Marty Wilde and Billy Fury. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it was then when you went to, to the seaside and saw the end of the pier shows that you actually got to see um, people like Cliff and, and Marty Wilde doing summer seasons and doing punk fun, you know, doing everything that uh, that the, you can imagine. The full entertainment thing. Yeah. Okay. So you so you so the essay, so you got involved in the early sixties and so who, who I, think, you... I think what stimulated me, there was always this there was always this debate about Elvis Presley not coming to Britain, even even going back to nineteen sixty two. Yeah. Because by that time he was out of the army and he was making more films. Um, and he was, uh, but, but but he wasn't doing any live entertainment anymore. Oh, okay. Why did he not? Why did he? Uh, why did he stop? In, in well, he was. He made more money making films. Didn't That's true. Now there was a, there, there was an offer made to Elvis in 1962 to do a tour. Sorry, Colonel Parker made an offer to RCA for Elvis to to, to make a tour of the United States and overseas. Um, but they. RCA wouldn't fund it. They thought a million dollars was was too much money at that time. Uh, okay. Not fast, really. Yeah. Um, considering the volume of re recorded material that, that, that Elvis made, so also, so. But for me, in 1962, something quite revolutionary happened, technology-wise, and they launched the first communication satellite, Telstar. Oh, okay. And I thought that it would be quite neat if Elvis appeared on telly in the states. And that we could watch it live in the United Kingdom, and uh, I got involved with a, with a campaign to try to get Elvis to do a satellite program. It didn't happen, um, not until 1973, ten years later. But um, the campaign worked really well. Is that where you met him? Because I say you met him in 1973, didn't you? 72, first of all. 72. When we took our first group to the States. Then in 73, and then in 77, because uh, we took. Uh, Members to see what turned out to be the last two shows that he did. Oh God. Okay, so that's sort of okay. So you 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 know you're at the front of the the Elvis scene. You know, that I mean that, I can't believe the technology sort of thing. It's uh, they said well, it's, technology drove everything. You have to remember that you know it was when when I was first involved in seeing records that were made of shellac. Yeah. When fed up with the with the record, you made a plum pot out of it, you put it in boiling water and moulded it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was a different, it was a different world. And then, of course, vinyl appeared from nowhere, so they did the 45s and 33 and a thirds, and 78 disappeared altogether. Um, and vinyl stayed around for a long time. It, and when 
even when they launched um, compact discs 20 mm -hmm. odd years ago, it took a while for vinyl to disappear, and now it's sort of bounced back again. Because yeah, I it's making a big resurgence. Like the, the taste, the feel, the look of the art, and also the fact that it's quite a magical thing is 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 a a record, a vinyl record. Yeah, no, I, I sort of understand that. I mean, uh, I think there's a, in all in all sort of areas of you know film, books, music, all this. There's there's always a, there's a single type. Like regardless of digital, I always think like say records will stick around. I always think hard you know books will stick around, physical books because people like that the tactile nature of them. Yeah, okay. I, I think. Yeah, but, but but all entertainment these days is well, all entertainment always has been technology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The fact that it gallops ahead in the after the Second World War, and we now have you know three three hundred or potentially three thousand television channels uh, and a million radio stations on the internet. You don't really need to search for anything; it's all there. Yeah, you think it is. Ago in the fifties, you had to search. Mm. I remember when a British TV journalist called Richard Dimble. Um, had a program on television where they showed the first TV pictures from Calais <laughs> on the BBC. That was quite a landmark yeah. thing. Only transmitting a, a few miles, but uh, it was across the sea. It was amazing. I mean, Absolutely amazing. I mean, thing like you say, in the 60s, I mean, the advances in technology then were huge. I mean, like you say, so you've gone from that to at the end of the 60s, you do get like, you know, man on the moon and broadcasting pictures from the moon and that sort of thing. Um, but you, I did a, a, a did a show last month and we talked about, um, we talked about horror films actually, um, but a friend of mine was talking about how he used to do tape trading. The only way you could get hold of certain films and stuff was actually, you'd go to conventions or you'd go to friends and you'd actually do yeah, like yeah. a tape trade, that sort of thing. I do think that that's well, much I think also what you have to remember, you know, when these first early television programs that Elvis made in 1956, there was no videotape. No, true. It didn't exist. So if you were a TV network and you and you wanted to <coughs> record the show, you either had to f shoot it in, on 35 millimeter film, mm -hmm. or you had to point a film camera at a TV screen and make what is known as a kinescope. Okay. And that's how the networks were able to preserve some of the stuff uh, that, that's now major parts of, uh, of TV archive. Yes. And all of Elvis's, all of Elvis's early footage that you see now re-released from time to time, uh, that Elvis performed live on TV in the in the fifties, mm -hmm. it's been preserved by that very process. That's where they pointed a camera at a TV set in the TV studio to wow. record the image and the sound. Wow. Okay, that's uh, must have been tedious, but I'm glad they did it to archive and you know maintain some of that stuff. But just to talk about his his early performance, actually getting into like Elvis as a as a person, his early TV performances, like you say, the Ed Sullivan Show and that sort of thing, actually was considered. Um, I've got it. It was described as. Uh, obscene and morally concerning, um, but do you think this added to his popularity? And but how did yeah, he? No. How did he I, feel I, about this? I wouldn't have a clue, to be honest with you, um, because he did what he did, and that was the craft that he was he, mm. he was honing. I mean, think you have to remember that all sorts of things have been written about Elvis over the years, and much of it's been made up by journalists who who were told by their uh, newspapers or magazines to interview Elvis Presley, and they never did, so they made the stories up. So if, if it's ever said that, you know, Elvis was disturbed and, uh, and upset that his mother might be horrified by his TV appearances, it was, it was all a bunch of nonsense. It was just, it was just made, it was just the diet of journalists being creative. So something's never, so it's, something's and, never and, changed. And really, if, if you still have to go back to what happened in, in, in this country at the same time. Mm -hmm. We had really bawdy comedians, the like of which would have never, ever got onto American television. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, America thought that Benny Hill was risque. You know, <laughs> it was a different, a different culture. Yeah, and no. I think you have to remember that Americans are a different culture. Obsessed with religion at times, in different forms, whereas we've always taken a, uh, let's say, 
unfair attitude towards religion. Yes. Uh, but it was it really does dominate um, what happens in the states. You know, you you, you, you get somebody uh, go to collect um, an Oscar or something. Uh, they'll thank their mother and father and their teachers, and uh, mm. most of all, I want to thank God. Well, you know that never happens over here. You don't. Somebody doesn't get a sports award from the BBC at the end of the year of being the best sports player or whatever, and then spurt out this wonderful diatribe of nonsense, yeah. thanking every man and his dog, and then praising God. It doesn't happen over here. Oh, so no. I think what you have to take into account is it is a different culture. So, I, mean, so I, am at my, I will tell you, I, I am at my son's house, and the first time we ever went to the States to see Elvis, mm -hmm. Greg was only little, and we were invited to go to this evangelical church in Memphis. He started to scream because he was only nine months old, and yeah. the note was passed along the pews, basically saying, "Will you remove your brat from the oh, from, from the congregation? You are <laughs> disturbing our religious yeah. um, okay. performance." I, mean, I do find America in that, in that sense quite baffling. I mean, you can you know they'll, they'll have a film where you know with guns firing, people getting stabbed, and horrendous violence, but. You know, an inkling of sort of sexual content or something anti-religious, and you know the censors are all over it. It does seem very bizarre. Yeah, I mean, you've got Donald Trump now. Yeah, uh, thanking God. You know, he's, he's possibly one of the most decadent people of the of, of the century so far, and uh, uh, he's, he he feels that he has to do it because he has to do it because if he don't, half the nation won't vote for him or won't support him or whatever. It's mm. weird. But this doesn't happen over here. You don't see Theresa May thanking God, or no. uh, so you did see Tony Blair doing it a bit too often, as I remember rightly. He was always thanking God. Yeah, yeah, that's a different. Yeah, I've got opinions on him as well. But that's a that's a different show, I think. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, he, I understand that as well. There was you know the controversy and that sort of thing, and whoever it was, I think like breaking the mold of the entertainment thing. Um, so, and of course, what you also had with Elvis was this incredible manager who, let's face it, had um, been a, caught by the carnival uh, world that he grew up in, how to promote somebody without the technology that we have these days. Yeah, you know, Tom we, Parker, we, 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 Colonel Tom you know, Parker. And then, then he, would, he would sort of go around with posters and, mm. and, 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 and paste them up himself. He, he was very much a hands-on manager. And not only did he do all that work, because he didn't have a big staff at all. No. Um, he, would, he would engage people to help in exchange for some favours or whatever, but he was, he, was, he, he, he promoted Elvis as almost like a carnival act, and it worked. And it worked over and above anybody else, because nobody else was promoting their act that way. Yeah, so Colonel Tom Parker then. So I, I find him a really interesting character, actually. So he he had full control, like full, extensive control of Elvis and his life and stuff. So, well, yeah, but then again, so did Brian Epstein of the Beatles. So oh no, I agree. No, no, evil man. Oh no, no, that's um, curious. So was he? Because I like you said about you know you said about the um, newspapers making things up. I find very conflicting stories about him, and I I couldn't place whether he was. You know, a positive or negative influence, or anything like that. No, he wasn't on. a Machiavellian type of person. He no. was just a manager who was doing what he had to do. Mm. Now, of course, you know, when you're when you're managing any star, you've got to really try to keep them grounded because mm. if they're not grounded, then it's, it's 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 really strange, isn't it? You shine a spotlight at somebody, and all of a sudden, the spotlight takes over. Mm. Uh, and it's not only singers and dancers and performers, it's politicians, it's anyone that is given this wonderful um, ability to communicate with the world. You have to really hold on to your, to your, um, oh, I don't think, I can't even think what the word is, but it's, you know, you're an integrity to make sure yeah. that you don't become bigger than you are. Now, Elvis on the whole was very grounded by his, by his upbringing for most of his career. 
but of course when 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 he got into Las Vegas, I think that was almost part of his um, his problem because he, when Elvis was in the movies and when he was um, actually playing um, live with 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 musicians like uh, Scotty Moore and DJ mm-hmm. Fontan, yeah, these were ordinary people. Mm. When he went into Las Vegas, he had uh, these sort of country rock musicians who had, had lived quite a wild existence. And right. all of a sudden, um, he did not have DJ Fontana or Scotty Moore in particular saying, look, Elvis, don't be a fool, yeah. do this. These guys didn't exert that kind of control over uh, over, over Elvis. And of course... There was a there was a continual battle between Elvis the Colonel, the musicians, the, Elvis's friends, his paid friends. So I, I guess Elvis, all of them were in a bit of a trap. As too was Colonel Parker, because Colonel Parker had to deliver the shows, had mm. to deliver the films, had to deliver the recordings, so you and, and Elvis had to perform them all. So yeah. there was nothing Machiavellian uh, uh, really about Colonel Parker. Now, obviously, Colonel Parker made some disastrous mistakes. In yeah. his act, uh, and Elvis made some equally silly mistakes by doing some of the things that that he should have turned around to Colonel Parker and say, "No, I'm not doing that." So yeah. you know, it's, it's well, weird. people make mistakes. But, you know, if you look at if you look at show business managers, and I've met many of them mm-hmm. um, because I have, um, some of them are quite sinister and freaky and, and, and weird I oh no I agree I, I, I have a I couple sat of in a, I sat in the manager's office one day and they're quite a famous person this is mm. and he arranged to have somebody's legs broken <laughs> um, and I, I didn't know him from a virus open he didn't know me yeah um, not shy about it no no and, uh, and if you look at Don Arden who uh, looked after the small faces he, he basically tortured those guys mm. He was, uh, he was quite evil. That's Cheryl, um, oh, what's his name? Cheryl Osborne's dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have heard, I mean, if, I say I've heard, you, hear, you do hear stories about, I mean, I've heard about the, um, like the Bee Gees, their father managed them, and he was, you know, quite, apparently quite horrific, and other, and other stories oh, as well. He, so. Yeah, I think, the, I mean, look at the, the, the Osborne, not the Osborne family, that was, that was quite okay. Mm. But if you look the at Jacksons the Jacksons and, yeah. family, yeah, I mean, these people were controlled because uh, it's a fact that they had to be. Yeah, I mean, to, 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 you've, you know, you said about so Elvis was a relatively grounded kind of guy, and seeing his ba- his upbringing, you know, uh, seeing uh, you know only child from a relatively poor background. <laughs> But when, getting into this, you, you know, you hear things. Is it the Graceland Mafia and and you know all the friends he had around him? Did it create a bubble around him then? That sort of this level of celebrity that I think I personally think his friends created the bubble mm. because I don't think they wanted any interlopers into a scene whereby they were getting everything mm. and they didn't want some people to get any of it. Yeah, and I think that is one of the reasons towards the end of Elvis's life, and particularly when Elvis was in Las Vegas, whilst he met the stars of the time, mm-hmm. and artists, people like that. On the whole, of the only people that actually broke through the, the wire, and not for forever, were yeah. people like Tom Jones, because obviously Tom Jones had uh, had an affinity to Elvis, and it was returned by returned by Elvis. Oh, and okay. Elvis was a cracking performer. I mean, he, he was fabulous. And I think people tend to lose lose um, touch with reality where Elvis was concerned. Mm. You know, to many people, he was a man that put on a baby grow, grow and sang 12 anthems, you know. Yeah. Our oh, Great oh. Thou Arts and Boke Salad Annie and that stuff. There was a hell of a lot more to Elvis than that. Oh, and that's the thing. I think when I, in the research, and I've done this, but recently, <laughs> I, when I watched... A couple of the films, and I watched, like, you know, I've seen him perform, and there's some of the documentaries behind the scenes. And I, I, I sort of find that there's like there's three Elvises. There's the on stage Elvis, you know, when he's he's in the heart of the performance, and he's obviously really enjoying himself. There's a quieter Elvis, you know, the almost like the true Elvis when he's on his own, and then there's this legend 
of... Well, the legend has been overtaken, really. You've got mm. to also remember, it's 40 years since Elvis died. Yes, of course. The record company has, over the years, exploited him in incredible ways, more, most recently with the, the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, mm. which has been absolute resounding success. There's nobody that's been dead 40 years who is selling the volume of music no. that Elvis Presley is. Now, it's very interesting also to note that th this isn't being replicated in the States. That material that's been put out over here and recorded over here will sell a million copies over here. It hasn't sold anywhere near that in the USA. Why is that, do you think? Well, because it hasn't. Just, it just, uh, it's very much a domestic thing. Right. There will be attempts, I believe, this coming year, which is the 40th anniversary of Elvis' death, yeah. to actually put on something similar to the Royal Philharmonic in Memphis with the same... The same um, visuals and, uh, and the like that, that, that has just completed the UK tour and is now in a few months uh, next year going into uh, Europe and then into Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, culminating, I believe, in uh, some big shows in Memphis. But it hadn't happened over here, uh, uh, over there. In actual fact, m most of Elvis's international success from no the year 2000 onwards, if you will, has been... British made. Yes. Okay. Uh, in other words, if you think of the uh, little less conversation with Nike and uh, and the like, well, oh, of course, yeah, yeah. Ducks, but of course, it was for British TV consumption. Yeah. Um, but never, it never happened in the states. Didn't understand it. Two reasons: one, they didn't know what remixes were. Number two, they didn't <laughs> know what soccer was. No, that's a good point. Very and it was done for the f football World Cup. Yeah. So. It, it, it's been incredibly successful what has happened over here, and, but it's only happened over here for two reasons. One, the people are, who, who are involved are passionate about it, mm -hmm. and the fan base over here has been incredibly loyal, mm. driven by the fact that the world's biggest Elvis Presley fan club is based over here. Uh, yeah, so I noticed that. So you're, 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 this fan club is the biggest one in the world then? Mm. Um, so, so, so there it is. And that's, and that's really the top of, and tail of the whole story. Yeah. And I'll conclude by saying, um, every year people say, is Elvis Presley still alive? <laughs> you know, he's, yeah. he's the gardener at Graceland and all that nonsense. Elvis is still alive in the hearts of Elvis fans, in the minds of journalists and in the, uh, at the fingertips of creators who, who these days can produce almost anything yes. with the technology that has been invented. And you may see in two years, three years, five years time, a um, three-dimensional Elvis running across the stage uh, as part of a live concert um, when they've got this... Uh, this yeah, the laser on. technology. That'd be, that would be fantastic. But it's, uh, but it's not the... It's nice to have the reinvented music. It's nice that Elvis mm. has been introduced to a total new market with far superior backing musicians than he ever had mm. when he was recording in, in Nashville, Memphis and in Los Angeles. And that hasn't hindered or interloped, if you like, into his, his, his craft. Um, I think once you start going much further, then, of course, you'll create a different Elvis. And it's the Elvis yeah. The the, 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 the the born in a shed and died in a castle image of Elvis Presley that everybody, if, if you will... The rags to riches story. Yeah, and okay. that's it. Brilliant. Excellent. All right, well, I hope that's good enough for what you've got. No, that's fantastic. Uh, uh, just, just, just a final thing, uh, as it's a podcast, uh, do you want to just plug the fan club? How can they get in contact with you or find it? <laughs> The Elvis Presley fan club is known the world over. Um, the easiest way you can get in touch with us is doing elvispresleyfanclub.com. Excellent. Thank you very much, Todd. Really appreciate All right, thank it. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye bye. So that was Todd Slaughter giving us his overview and his insight on Elvis, uh, his experiences as a kid. And uh, the El British Elvis fan club. So, if you are interested in Elvis or you are a fan, uh, go seek it out. Actually, they do a lot of really good stuff all across the world. It's one of the largest Elvis fan clubs in the world. Um, thank you for joining us. And if you want to know more about 20th Century Geek, uh, please uh, email me at 
20th century geek at gmail.com that's 2-O-T-H century geek uh, the same on twitter at 20th century geek uh, I'm on facebook uh, facebook slash 20th century geek and on uh, instagram so it's pretty much the same again 20th century geek thank you very much for joining us um, I hope to hear from you soon uh, have a good week